knows about Krishna, and they have some respect for the sadhus like us. So that's why we're going to Krishna, Krishna's place. And we think, I almost said Krishna Loka, <laughs> but we're going to Krishna Loka, but that, that too. Um, but our community should be there. And as a community, as a group, we should all pitch in together and make this project a success because this is going to be our university of higher knowledge. And of course, we have our courses on the web, but we also want to have courses, uh, physical courses there in India, where we're in a village environment. We have the cows, we have the farms and everything. And you can see direct, close up, firsthand, personally, how a community, a village community, is structured. See, in India, for example, if you live in a village, and let's say you run into somebody from the other side of the village, they're not part of your family, how do you relate to them? Huh? Well, in India, you have family relationships, and then you also have village relationships. And basically, the village relationship that you have with a person is how you would relate to that person if they were a member of your family. Huh? For example, if you have, you run into somebody who is the same age as uh, your parents, then you relate to them like a mother or father, or an uncle, or some, some older uh, person in your family. Or if you run into someone who is l younger, then you relate to them like a younger cousin or a younger uh, sibling or something like that. So you have a village relationship with everybody in your village. You have a, a, a ground, you have a medium for a relationship there because you come from the same village. You're all probably in the same religion as well. Most of the villages, especially in South India, are like temple towns. They're founded around a temple. And so the style of worship and the, the lineage of that temple is pretty much the spiritual path that everybody in that village is going to be on. So we're going to find a village town, a, a temple town, temple village, that is of a similar lineage, probably Madhva lineage uh, in India. And we're going to locate ourselves on the outskirts of the town. Huh? And so we have farmland and we have a little ashram. Right? And we're going to participate in the temple life also. We're going to start a prashadam distribution program that uh, will work through the temple itself and uh, help all the poor people, all the hungry people in that area. And uh, we're going to reveal all the details of these things at our community meeting during the Janmashtami festival. So uh, everyone who is there, then they are going to be expected to be like community organizers. And when we go to India to channel the energy of our whole community towards establishing this project in India and making it a success, then that will become the training center for community organizers uh, to go anywhere in the world and start their own community. If you have the urge, if you have the calling, if you have the skills, you can go anywhere in the world and establish a bridge community. Uh, but how are you going to get those skills unless you actually live in a community where you can exercise those skills? See? We've all become crippled, socially crippled, by being in this Western environment where there is basically no community. See? So we have to be immersed in that community for some time to restore those skills, those social skills. Then we can go somewhere else and teach people how to be in a community again. Because in the West, we've forgotten. And we're going to have to learn or develop those skills all over again from scratch. It's better that we go someplace where those skills are already in use and we can experience them and then transfer those skills to other places. You see? The, the essence of this approach is in understanding or diagnosing the actual nature of the problem. See, the nature of the problem. Why haven't the Western devotees been successful in establishing 
self-sufficient communities anywhere in America or Europe or places like that, even South America, uh, because they've lost the skills of living in a community. Where are those skills still alive? In India, in Vrindavan, uh, and other holy places like that. And there are many, many sacred places in South India. North India has become very much spoiled, too much westernization. Uh, but South India is still very much the original culture. So by going to South India and learning, immersing ourselves in the culture there, we will revive these community building skills. And then by coming there and getting trained in our school, going through all the degree programs and getting your advanced degrees, uh, then you'll be able to go anywhere and establish a Vaishnava community because you will have those skills. If somebody in the West here simply says, oh, I'm going to start a bridge community, where are they going to acquire those skills? You might say it's possible by trial and error, but that would take a long time. And we don't have the time. And we're going to be in a very, very stressful situation soon, economically, socially, politically. Uh, so uh, it's going to be very, very difficult to establish a community in the West. That's why we're going and taking shelter of India. In my mind, where's the safest place in the world? It's going to be if you're in the midst of a large number of devotees, because Krishna protects his devotees. He says so, right, in Bhagavad Gita. So where's the safest place in the world where there are lots of lots of devotees? And that's South India, as far as devotees who are actually following. Not just devotees in name, you know, who put on tilak and wear the clothes, but they're not actually following. But devotees who are actually following the process, who are actually living the life of a devotee. They're in South India, millions of them. So that's where we want to be. That's going to be the safest place on the whole planet. Um, do we have any more questions? Huh? No, that was the answer. <laughs> well, this all fits together, you know. It's not like we have uh, a difference between our philosophy and our practice, or between our practice and our community, or between our community and, and the way we preach. It's all, it's all like tied together. There was a question from David Lugan. Do you have a recommended place to convert U.S. dollars to gold uh, or precious metals? There was a couple of responses after that. Stefan posted a link to a website and said that is the place. And Mother Swati responded by saying numismatic gold is the biggest ripoff. So there's some argument going on there. Yeah, don't, don't buy gold coins and stuff like that. Uh, you should buy physical gold, uh, ingots, gold bars. Best place to do that is India. I'm not going to say any more about this because we're going to discuss this in detail at the Janmashtami festival. Uh, we're going to create an arrangement where all this is possible. So uh, the, best, the best thing is to yeah, get out of dollars and get out of paper and get into physical gold. Yeah, don't buy gold coins. That is a ripoff. They're selling for far greater than their actual worth. There's a question from Ronald. I would like to know more about Rasa Tattva. Which book should I read? Krishna Nectar book? of Devotion. <laughs> Nectar of Devotion has the whole science of Rasa Tattva. To, and the way it explains Rasa Tattva is very interesting because it starts, the whole first wave, the first section, is a detailed description of the process of sadhana bhakti. Okay, so what does that have to do with Rasa Tattva? Well, just to talk about rasa tattva is meaningless in and of itself unless we have a process to realize it. Uh, 
like we were saying the other day, um, everything in the scriptures is meant to be practical. It's meant to be realized. It's not just theory. It's not just empty philosophy. It's not just words. It's a practice, ultimately. And that practice is designed to bring us to direct conscious realization of all these truths. So if we don't have a process for actually realizing rasa tattva, then what's the use of empty discussion? So therefore, Nectar of Devotion starts off with the science of devotional service. And only then it talks about rasa tattva. Uh, because why? To actually realize rasa tattva, you have to be in the raganuga bhakti range of sadhana. You have to be past the anartha nivritti stage of sadhana. Uh, 